I think that's the only card I need tonight, Kevin. <laughs> At least you've got them. <laughs> Welcome, everyone, to tonight's uh, pre meeting briefing session for Monday, the 16th of November 2020. Hopefully, this time next week, we'll have a lot more to celebrate. Uh, so, PMB, PMBS1, the apologies. I have apologies from Councillor King, Stutchbury and Cameron. Uh, I've not been away, made aware of any conflict of interest declarations. Um, PMBS3 is Aubrey Business Connect update. Uh, Carrick Valance and Barry Young. So where are you guys? Where you go? There you go. Welcome. Welcome to everyone that's here tonight. It's, it, it's a change to have people other than staff in the chamber. So uh, just to give the... Councillors, a head, heads up, there are people from the community here and we are streaming. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Mack. Um, we thank, thank you, uh, Albury City Council, for the opportunity to attend the briefing session this evening. Um, we value the investment that Albury City has in Albury Business Connect and the partnership we share with Albury CBD. We're also very proud of the return we provide on that investment and the return we give on that partnership. So we're very pleased to be able to talk to you about that tonight. We're going to talk about some key measurables and key achievements out of our operational plan, which is a reflection of our uh, 2024 strategic plan. So we have an update for you about how we're tracking um, year to date to the 31st of October, how we're looking at those uh, key measurables. So Carrick will be providing part of the presentation tonight so forgive us as we slide the microphone between us um, but Carrick will kick it off with um, some commentary around some key statistics which I present to you now. Thank you Barry and thank you councillors for the opportunity to um, chat with you all tonight and give you an update on where the business is at uh, for the current financial year. Uh, the first slide that you should have on your screen uh, if you're viewing at home councillors is the uh, overview of the business uh, statistics. So working from left to right, um, our membership uh, numbers, current mem membership numbers are at 379. Our six year running average uh, is 415. So 379 members uh, is a decrease from the average and that can be attributed to the uh, direct and indirect impacts of COVID-19 on the business community. Uh, our forecast was that it was going to be more severe than what it actually is. So um, we think that's a, a pretty good achievement, uh, all things considered. Uh, we have dropped between uh, March and September, we've dropped 60 members. The same For the same period over the last six years, the average uh, for that is 51 members. So uh, we haven't dropped that many uh, be considering COVID, which is another uh, a pretty good result for the business. In terms of new members, uh, we actually, um, uh, we initi initiated a new membership drive that we've never tried before, which was a free trial. And this was at the height of the impacts of COVID-19 on business. We uh, felt that we had the responsibility to stand up and, um, and be accountable to the business community. So we offered the three month free trial. After that three months, uh, we had about a 65% take up of paid membership as a result. Uh, so a very positive result. Um, from members experiencing the product firsthand. And uh, again, another a, a great result considering the, um, the climate that we've been facing. Uh, currently for the financial year, our membership retention is at 81.2%. Um, our standard or average uh, membership retention rate is about 80, between 83% to 85%. Uh, so we are tracking relatively well, uh, all things considered. Um, in terms of advocacy, we've uh, obviously had to change the, the business focus through COVID-19. So we've played uh, quite a significant role in advocacy on the behalf of the business community. We've conducted one study on the COVID impacts in general. Uh, we've conducted two studies on the border closure impacts, and we've recently just completed our, uh, our fourth uh, study on the mental health of the business community in terms of the workforce uh, in Albury. I'm pretty pleased to say that 
uh, out of the six recommendations that we made to government uh, in terms of the border closure and the COVID impacts that uh, four of those uh, recommendations were adopted, not saying that it was a result of uh, us alone, but um, a good collective effort. Uh, in terms of events, obviously, they've been impacted quite heavily um, for the obvious reasons of, uh, of restrictions being placed on, on the gatherings. Uh, in saying that, we've been able to redefine the value offering and the relevance for our members and provide online events and start to build a catalogue of uh, events that are accessible on demand 24-7 for our membership, which will be um, a permanent change for the business. Um, so digitising and modernising the business is is the key focus at, at the moment and we're well uh, into that journey, which is a, a great relief for a tech nerd like myself. Um, also, through the last couple of months, we've achieved a rebrand, which had been on the cards for uh, quite a number of months, um, but we felt that it was appropriate to bring that forward uh, so that we could refresh the value offering to our members uh, and um, and help drive some more engagement. So we have rebranded from Albury Northside Chamber of Commerce to Albury Business Connect. Uh, and the process involved a quite a lengthy consultation period with our membership uh, as well, where they told us that they want the organisation to be called Albury Business Connect. Um, and the that feedback was very overwhelming. In terms of the financial uh health of the business. The business is in, in quite good shape, all things considered. We, for the last financial year, were, we achieved a profit of $137,000. And this is very largely due to the impacts of COVID-19. Uh, you'll see on the slide on the right-hand side there that we had a forecasted profit of $22,000. Uh, we, because of COVID-19, we had $25,000 of unspent budget. Uh, we and that's due to not being able to hold, hold events and whatnot. We had forty thousand dollars in unspent wages due to a high turnover of um, of staff in the organisation, and the main contributing factor to the uh, profit was the government financial assistance um, in terms of uh, the cash flow boost and job keeper. Uh, so. Essentially, if COVID didn't happen, we were on track to making our forecasted profit uh, of twenty to twenty-five thousand um, dollars. What does that mean for the business? It means that we can reinvest that back uh, into a better user experience. So we're going to do that through a new CRM. Uh, we're going to do that through injecting uh, profit back into the twenty or the current financial year operating budget. We're going to upgrade all of our systems and software so that there's compatibility automation uh, and intelligence in it so that uh, we can do more of what we should be doing, which is advocating and, uh, and more business development with our members and growing that membership base. Uh, we're also investing in a partnership with the Board of Trust on a new uh, giving initiative and uh, a business intelligence dashboard, which will allow us to analyze the business more closely and progressively without having to spend hours on reporting. And my slide clicker seems to have failed. Terence, are you able to, there, there we go, thank you. So in terms of some, just some um, exposure stats here, our social media in every department is increasing. Um, pleased to say that. Uh, Probably most importantly, the YouTube, I think, um, statistics are, are one of the most significant to us. Um, we've got a much longer watch time now. We've gone from two and a half hours to 30 hours worth of watch time uh, on average, and our views per video are increasing and our total views are increasing as well. So that means that the on-demand content for um, for our events is is relevant and it's hitting the spot. Um, same thing can be said for Albury CBD. Uh, Albury CBD, uh, I guess, to add context to this, we've in, uh, restructured the business to now have a communications person part-time and they've been able to channel quite a lot of energy into our um, social media and engagement online. Uh, so you'll see that the Albury CBD stats equally have been increasing as well across the board. And if you want to go to the next slide, Terence, and I'll hand back to Barry for a, a highlight of Albury CBD. 
Thanks, Carrick. Uh, Orby CBD, being chair of Orby CBD, this uh, slide is close to my heart. So, uh, and heart is really appropriate considering the heart of Orby campaign, which we can see there, which has been a terrific initiative um, put forward by um, Orby Business Connect and Orby CBD. I've got to thank Carrick and the team, particularly Megan and Gabby, for the work they've done with Orby CBD. The Heart of Albury campaign, you've probably seen stickers pop up in shops all over Albury. It's really um, an opportunity for businesses to wear their heart on their window in terms of their support for not only local businesses, but the local community as well. So it's been great to see that uptake. Also, the gift, gift card program um, has been really well received by traders and from corporates alike. We've now gone over excess of $20,000 in sales. 60, I think, uh, traders are now accepting gift cards. So the momentum we're gathering with the gift card program is has been amazing and has been a real fillip for the traders in Albury CBD. The gift guide will continue to roll out as we get closer to Christmas. Fortnightly photo shoots with selected businesses where we promote them through Albury CBD um, is happening at the moment and has been a great initiative. The website is continually being redeveloped and will look fantastic once it's done and it's more consumer focused than it has been in the past you've probably seen the martins buses running around trying to paint the town pink as best we can as well as the cbd street flags which we thank albury city council for i must say albury cbd is probably as vibrant as i've seen it in my time in albury um, the the amount of work that's being done by albury business connect and albury cbd to help traders particularly through covid um, and helping support local businesses been uh, a, a real highlight for um i think uh, our local community so Big thanks to our team. And I'd just like to add, uh, in terms of Aubrey CBD's uh, current focus, what we're seeing is we're pulling together um, elements that we've been working on individually over the last uh, 12 months, which is uh, building a consumer contact database um, and pulling that into uh, a connection piece with the businesses themselves. So, uh, we everything that we're doing within Albury CBD uh, is aimed to connect and to develop the Albury CBD businesses. So, for example, with the fortnightly photo shoots, we are using them for our own content, but then the businesses have the opportunity to buy that um, that those photos at a very discounted price, so that then they can start to improve and increase their uh, perceived quality uh, online as well. So. Um, you'll see in the coming months a new campaign uh, to uh, target consumers and business separately. So we're uh, growing the, the Aubrey CBD into two sectors, which is consumer and business, uh, which will be a very strong focus moving into next year. Our strategic objectives. So our strategic plan for 2024, uh, the four-year plan, had three key pillars in the strategic plan that are important to us, which are leadership, community and growth. So we'll talk through each of those key pillars um, and talk about some key achievements. I'm a little bit mindful of time because I want to leave uh, plenty of time for questioning. So please forgive us if we uh, feel a little bit rushed through this, but I do want to allow a fair bit of time for questions should you need them. Our first objective, which will be leadership once she pops over. Why is this important to us? Uh, it was important to us in the strategic plan because we want to, we want to be seen as a leading business organisation in our community. We want to grow leaders within our community. It's very important that we attract high impact leaders to our organisation and we want to enhance innovation and create creativity. So Carrick will talk about some of the key achievements we've been able to lock away with leadership. So in terms of leadership, our focuses are building our profile in the community so that we can attract more leaders, but also to then develop the uh, leadership within the business community as well. Um, our key achievements in leadership are, uh, and this is from the 1st of July, we've had uh, 36 media appearances, uh, a great opportunity to, uh, opportunity to develop our uh, profile in the community. And uh, it's been, a great journey so far. We, um, we've got many opportunities as a result of it. We've supported the launch of the Wodonga Innovation Hub and we'll keep a finger on the pulse in terms of that uh, as a local leadership 
uh, initiative. We are also researching the leadership gaps and opportunities for local programs uh, specific to Albury as well and the greater region. Um, we're more com connected than ever now with the local community and government groups. And I think that's probably been a bit of a byproduct of COVID. So um, looking for the positives in everything, that's definitely one of them. Um, we've success successfully launched a monthly informative newsletter for members, and we've also consolidated our communications. Um, we've ad advocated strongly for better operating uh, conditions for the businesses uh, through COVID-19, and we've developed a powerful network of information sources to keep members informed with the clear and the accurate information uh, that they need. Just on the, this slide with the uh, percentages achieved, this information will be made available to all councillors should they seek it with a little bit more detail should you want it. So we won't spend time working through those at the moment, but all that information is available on request. Community, uh, another key pillar for us to, is to build a strong supportive community for us to be well known in the community, not only in the business community, but in the wider community as well. We wanna be respected and credible and we also want to make a difference in our wider community. So uh, for obvious reasons, COVID-19 has impacted our ability to connect and engage with the community in what we would call the traditional sense. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so we've had to move the way that we uh, would normally do that to an online sense. So. Um, because of COVID, it has held back our progress with the community engagement. However, what we can say is that we've, um, we had a, a very successful Small Business Month mini conference in October featuring Kate Carnell, uh, the Small Business and Family, family Enterprise Ombudsman, uh, and eBay, uh, and a few other individual uh, uh, business personalities as well. Uh, we've increased our member to member advertising online. So what we're seeing is a shift with our members wanting to engage with each other online. Uh, we've maintained engagement ourselves with our members online, excuse me. <coughs> I think I've got a lung full of pollen from my run this afternoon. Um, we've built online content, as I said earlier, which is accessible by members 24 uh, seven. And that's becoming uh, more and more popular as we build on that library. We launched the Better Place Project, which is a, a workplace wellbeing initiative to gauge the mental health of the workforce uh, in Albury. And uh, we've finalised a two-year partnership with the Board of Trust on a, a great new local giving initiative called the BT Give 500, which is being launched this month. Uh, on top of that, we see ourselves as uh, being able to play a, a quite an important role. <laughs> Thank you, Councillor. <laughs> um, uh, in giving support to other local chambers to help uh, mentor and guide them to a successful model, which we believe uh, we have through a great working relationship with Albury City Council. Uh, and that's been quite rewarding. So we've been working with chambers in uh, Milestom, Arunga, uh, Kempsey, Wagga, Mount Beauty and Shepparton. Thanks, Carrick. Growth, another key pillar for us. It's an obvious one to grow, which we all want to do um, and we will continue to do, but we want to be known in our community. We want to make sure that we're respected and credible within our community. Most of all, we want to make a difference in our community um, and continue to grow and to build a strong and supportive organisation and to remain relevant. And I think relevance is a word that I come back to all the time with our um, Orby Business Connect is that we need to remain relevant to the business community, not only now, but into the future as well. Hopefully my voice, oh, that's much better. Thank you, Alice. <laughs> um, so just before we move on to this slide, uh, onto the next slide, you'll notice that uh, midway down, one of the uh, strategic actions there, the explore revenue opportunities to build a stronger uh, financial health. The reason that is so low is because of our calendar year sponsorship program and because we haven't taken in that sponsorship. So we're in the process of that at the moment. And uh, at the moment, our retention rate for sponsorship is looking quite strong and healthy. So um, we will see that the next time we report to council. Thanks, Terence. 
So key achievements for growth, uh, the new member be benefit uh, in development at the moment is a training uh, program which is delivered by TAFE New South Wales, something that I've never seen uh, in the chamber movement before. So essentially that's building a training arm into the business of Albury Business Connect. Uh, we're investing uh, our 2019-2020 profit back into the business, like I said earlier, and uh, developing a corporate membership package in response to the support that we're starting to see as a result of COVID-19. There is a lot of uh, corporate interest in the regional areas at the moment, so we're going to be capitalising on that. Um, we've got strong sponsorship uh, support from those corporates as well. Uh, advertising and room hire is strong in terms of um, building our own you know, financial revenue streams. Whilst it's not a huge factor, uh, it is definitely consistent. And uh, something that I'm very proud of, we've developed a great advocacy framework uh, for our members as well. Uh, we've consolidated our communications into four regular EDMs, uh, providing the best, most clear and concise information that we've ever been able to deliver before. And uh, like we've mentioned earlier, we've rebranded from Aubrey Northside Chamber of Commerce to Aubrey Business Connect. Thanks, Carrie. We've spoken a little bit about Aubrey CBD, so there's probably no need to um, expand on what we've spoken about, but happy to take any questions about what's going on with Aubrey CBD as um, we are happy to take questions now about Aubrey Business Connect as well. Thanks, Barry. Question from Councillor Vanderman. You turned down, off. Unmute. How about that? Yeah, yep, all good. Thanks, guys, for a really great uh, snapshot of where you've been and uh, where you propose to go. Uh, just a, a quick one. Is the membership fee, uh, and I don't consider it to ex be excessive or, or um, you know, large or whatever, but in the COVID times, is the, uh, is the um, membership fee a... Uh, a, a turn off for people to join or stay members? In my experience, it hasn't been, and Carrie, you might have more information about whether there's resistance to uh, joining Chamber because of cost. Um, I think not. I think the membership that we've um, gained this year, the new members have seen the value that we've been able to provide, particularly with COVID, about where we've been able to direct people to source help uh, in terms of uh, navigating through COVID and I guess reassuring businesses that we could help them through. So I think the value is seen by the membership and potential membership as being fair. Um, but as always, it's part of our strategy to reassess the membership program and we'll, we'll, we'll look in more detail about a more structured um, tiered uh, method of uh, membership as well. Yeah, well, the, the the point that I was uh, I suppose uh, going to get to was uh, in terms of where you are with your 2019 20 profit in uh, and ploughing it back into the business, which is is great. Now, I'm just wondering if for a 12 months period you can't just look at the uh, you know the membership fee uh, and use some of that uh, if you like windfall profit to uh, attract some members at a lower uh, at a lower fee rate, um, but in that time, use that time to uh, to actually highlight and sell the benefits of membership of the uh, chamber to those people. And then the other the other observation from my point is looking at the slides. It continually refers to the ABC. Can we just change that to the chamber? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, with our market research, we definitely. Um, move to Aubrey Business Connect for some reasons around the yep. term chamber and some of the connotations and when I spoke before about relevance, um, I think uh, our relevance in today's business world is a little bit different to what it was 10, 15 years ago where there was connotations around chamber about men in suits and the high end of town. We've really purposely changed the landscape and our language around business and who are we trying to attract to the organisation and was felt and part of that would be the term chamber does evoke some of those thoughts. Um, so with the hope of remaining relevant now and in, into the future, I think ABC has got a lot of merit. 
look, there'd be something like, um, from my perspective, thanks, Mr. Mayor, for your indulgence. <laughs> You're right. But, but there's something like three or 4,000 individual business operators in the Albury Wodonga Chamber. And I think that the Chamber would be a sensational voice for those uh, single person uh, business operators. And I just wonder whether there's any plans to target that particular sector of our uh, economy in terms of, um, you know, uh, membership of the, uh, an advocacy for that, that group of uh, individuals. I think I'll defer to Carrick on this question because I know he has um, information that he can provide to you about sole operators and smaller smaller businesses. Yep. Thanks for the um, for the question and the uh, and the feedback, Councillor Van Ven. So at the moment, our I guess just to give some more context as well to the rebrand um, that was in response to who uh, majority of our membership now uh, seem to be, which are sole traders, micro business and small business, all of which make up 70% roughly of our membership. In terms of sole traders, they make up about 45%. So we already do represent quite a large um, uh, sector of the, I guess, of that, um, of the sole trader um, business in Albury uh, and Wodonga, I should say. Um, so yes, the, the plan is to keep um, being relevant and um, and building products for those sole traders, whilst also um, for the first time that I've seen in the eight years that I've been with Chamber, uh, also trying to um, provide more relevance to the larger um, businesses as well, uh, which I think there's quite a lot of value in. And then in terms of coming back to one of our streak, uh, key strategic focuses, leadership, is connecting those two so that we can positively impact and affect the passing of that knowledge between those two so that then we have a much better journey for the um, for those sole traders. All right. Thanks, uh, Carrick and uh, Kevin. The good work, both of you, gentlemen. Thanks, uh, Councillor Vanderman. Uh, Councillor Glacken, question. Thank you. Here you yep. go. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, you talked about um, corporate membership and that you're going to work on that and it's, there's, uh, there's some appetite for it at the moment. What do you mean by corporate membership? Is that the larger companies or...? Thank you, Councillor Glacken. Yeah, that is, um, it's developing a membership package which has more relevance to those larger businesses. Um, so you know, to, to most of the small operators, the business advice that we're able to provide, the industrial relations, um, you know, commercial law, all that kind of stuff is really relevant because they don't have access to that. Mm. Uh, not so for the larger uh, businesses, those what we kind of term as the corporates. So uh, what we're doing is uh, re-evaluating what that offering is and can be to those corporates, uh, and then we'll be creating a special package for them. Um, and that will most likely... Um, include more engagement opportunities with the business community. Um, and, you know, it might be in mentoring leadership, um, uh, you know, kind of finding out market sentiments and, and things like that as well. So giving them more reason to want to, you know, be a, a, an active member in the chamber. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'll be quick, Mr. Mayor. Um, given the big push for shop local, how are you guys going with any campaign uh, in, in Albury for Shop Local? Certainly the heart of Albury campaign has been a success where it's encouraged um, traders to look after each other, to support each other, but also for to encourage consumers to shop locally. The gift card program also um, directs money directly back into Albury CBD. So we've now got 60 traders uh, involved in that program, which means the money that is being commissioned on those gift cards will be spent in the Albury CBD, has to be spent in the Albury CBD. So we're getting good uptake from some corporates in terms of using the gift card as their, I guess, in lieu of um, Christmas parties, that type of thing. So we've had some good organise, a good corporate support for that, which will in, um, obviously encourage by stealth people supporting local businesses. Thank you. Councillor Doxey. Uh, thank you, Mr Mayor. Quick observation. 
I'm really pleased to have changed the, uh, the name. I think it's going to work well. It reflects what the community are looking for. And I want to encourage my fellow councillors not follow the lead of Wodonga and leave their chamber without assistance. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Doxy. No further questions on the screen there? The young girl's, she's gone missing in action. Okay, uh, just a couple of questions from me, guys. There she is. Just a couple of questions from me. Uh, I see just uh, going through the websites, you've still got the other one that's still hanging around. Is there a, a time when you're going to sort of cut it off at the knees? Is there a time plan for that? Thank you, Mayor Mac. Yeah, that's actually happening uh, in the next week. Yeah, we've just uh, had to leave that open to try and extract a bit of data out of it. Who did your website design? Uh, we actually did that in in house. Yeah, could so, you do some at uh, Aubrey Cities. That'd be great <laughs> for no, the right I like price. Your website looks great, uh, and I think it's very much uh, very professional and well badged. I like the references from the board to the LinkedIn profiles. Less clunky. It's all pretty good. So well done. It's a good. Good example. In terms, you mentioned at some point, and correct me if I'm wrong, that uh, you had a plan for your board to do some governance training. Has that uh, occurred at all? It hasn't occurred, but we are aware of it and absolutely looking to, yep. Thanks, Barry. Uh, and the partnership with Board of Trust, could you just expand on that a little bit? I just sort of, I knew there was something going on. I just, You've been trying to get something together then for a couple, quite a couple of years. Yeah, thanks, Ms. Uh, Mayor Mack. So we uh, going winding the clock back about three years, um, or actually probably even more. We had a named sub fund with the Border Trust, which was for a local leadership uh, program, yep. and that program uh, kind of fizzled out for want of a better term. Uh, the Border Trust have been working on a new initiative uh, with us over the last. Oh, it's it's probably over 12 months now um, and uh, it's basically us attributing a percentage of our membership fees to a local uh, philanthropic giving uh, initiative which aligns with our strategic focuses as well. Okay, excellent. And uh, now look, I think, um, yeah, the, the website is a really good representation of what you're doing as a business and how you're going to change the process with your strategic plan on there as well. It's really, uh, really good. With COVID-19, uh, have you seen uh, the businesses that you are dealing with? I know the CBD has been very busy. What's a prevailing anecdotal view of a lot of the businesses, Barry, you're in amongst it all down there? Is it positive? Because we're still getting, a, you know, the bit, the shop, the few shops empty, but to be honest, I think uh, they were empty before COVID-19, but what's your view, Barry? Well, I, in my time uh, retailing in Dean Street, I don't think I've seen the city as vibrant as it is at the moment. Mm. We're getting a lot of traffic um, coming to Albury, particularly from northeast Victoria because of the mass situation, but we're also getting a lot of visitation from along the river, Cobram, Tokemwall, Hay, Wagga. So... Masks is one thing, but if the offer's not right, masks won't make a difference. So I think the offer's right, so people are coming. And the feedback I'm getting is that um, people are coming to stay for a night, spend a day shopping, and have been really surprised by the offer that Aubrey is presenting at the moment. I think it's um, exceptional, and I think the feedback we're getting uh, will continue to develop and continue to grow the Aubrey CBD. Um, I think we've... COVID has exposed us to a greater greater market than we've had previously, and I think that'll pay dividends um, in the years ahead. Okay, just as a, a reminder that we still we are still considering any support we need to provide businesses, and certainly rate pays post COVID. I mean, we're nowhere near um, at the end of it, as is evidenced by Adelaide in the last couple of days. But in terms of recovery. It's a it's a, a prime importance for us as a council to understand what those needs are and if you can provide any up to date information we're all we're all ears as a group because we want to support our ratepayers and certainly our community without our businesses there is no community so thanks for your presentation and I don't think there are any further questions and I see you've got a few of your board members here 
this evening. Thanks for thanks for them for coming tonight. And uh, you've had a bit of a change in your board too, by the looks of it. So all yeah. good things come, don't they? Yeah, thank you. And I welcome Bernadette Torreson. Uh, she's stepped up to deputy chair along with Alex who's here tonight and Celeste Pierce, our treasurer. So we uh, had three new board members come on this year. We had six applications for the three vacancies. Um, some really good people missed out on the board and we're hoping to incorporate them in the board at some in some capacity in the near future. Um, so yeah, very pleased with the new look of the board and particularly pleased with the interests that we've got. Mm, okay, mate. Well, thanks again. And uh, just a reminder, councillors, they have a Christmas party on the 30th of November at the Atura. So it'd be great to see our councillors there. Thanks again, guys, and thanks for your attending this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, we have Mama Governance Review, and I've got David Fischel who's zooming in. David, welcome to uh, our chamber here in Albury. Uh, look forward to your presentation, mate. Thank you. And we've got Breve, the director from the gallery, also present with us this evening, and Simona. So, who would like to start the ball rolling out of all these lovely people? Simona, off you go. Thank you. Um, thank you, councillors, for the opportunity to provide you with an update and to get your feedback on the MAMA Governance Review Project. Now, just to take you back, in May 2018, Council considered a report on MAMA's governance where Council endorsed that further research be undertaken on a Section 3 355 committee and a facility managed by a separate company limited by guarantee and governed by a board. Now, as part of that 2018 report, a number of additional steps needed to be taken by MAMA, which have been done. And this includes the establishment of a skills-based advisory board, which was done in 2018, uh, the development of a strategic plan that was endorsed by council in 2019, the distribution sorry, the dissolution of the Mo Mama Friends Group and launch of the in-house Mama membership program, which was at the start of 2020, and the ongoing repositioning of Mama's Art Foundation as the primary fundraising body. Now, all of these pre-steps have been completed, which allows us now to go into the governance review. Mama has also completed its business plan and is at the moment presenting its functional review to the executive this week. Again, all steps needed as part of this work. Now, MAMA has engaged David Fischel from Positive Solutions to provide an external, independent review and some rigour around this process. David brings a wealth of experience in strategic planning and governance and organisational development in the arts and the cultural sector. He has also previously worked on our creative economy strategy, strategy so he is familiar with our organisation. Now, I'd like to hand over to David from Positive Solutions. The aim of this session is to get your feedback, to get your input, to make sure we're on the right track and to make sure that we understand what your views and what your thoughts are. Thank you. And if I'll hand over to David, please. Uh, thanks, Simona. Um, do you want me to share screen and run the presentation from my end, or are you going to change the slides from your end? You end, I believe. Okay, that's good. I'll just share screen. Give me one second. So uh, I can't see you now, but you should be able to see the opening slide. Um, uh, so what, what I'd uh, like to do, and thank you for the introduction, um, Simona, um, is uh, just talk very briefly through the, uh, the structure of our report and the areas it covers and the advice that, uh, that we're giving in terms of looking at these two, uh, these two models. Um, so uh, Simona said this was, this was the brief. It's a very specific, uh, very specific brief. Um, and it is worth noting that this issue of looking at um, an appropriate governance model for a gallery, especially a regional gallery. Um, um, Albury City is not alone in this. There are quite a lot of galleries around the country which have been addressing um, this issue, specifically those galleries that are sitting within local, uh, local government structures, um, and many of which are owned and operated by local governments. And they're facing a, a common issue, which is to do with optimizing their capacity to um, uh, secure and encourage philanthropic support. Um, but also look at building strength through having um, uh, a, a skilled and experienced uh, board. And there's some other factors that are driving this sort of um, temp, uh, so that this investigation of alternative of alternative um, structures. 
um, and, uh, and particularly looking at arm's length, arm's length models. So um, if, the, if the job is to look at uh, the governance of, of the gallery, it's probably worth just spending a second um, explaining what governance means in a gallery context, because the word governance is bandied around and can mean different things to different people. Um, the governance can be talking about the ownership of the building and the collection that's, that's housed in it. Um, the way that uh, uh, elements within the collection are acquired and, and cared of, the employment arrangements for, uh, for the staff, and the other day-to-day -day operational arrangements, or arrangements, all the functions that need to take place in order to fulfill the business of a, of a gallery. Um, then fundraising structures and philanthropy, which I've already mentioned. Um, often when people are talking about governance of the gallery, they're talking also about the arrangements in terms of a friend's or supporter's structure. Some galleries have those as, a, um, as an arm's length entity and in fact, in some cases, they precede the existence of the gallery, and in other cases, they are in um, they're in house as a sort of members scheme. Um, and then finally, another aspect of governance, which is, I view like a second tier, is how do we deal with uh, commercial activity within the gallery, and specifically food and beverage and retail? Um, are we running that in house? Are we outsourcing and so on? Which is an issue that council have dealt with uh, in relation to other um, other facilities as well. So those are components of the governance model, um, most but not all of which are relevant um, to the issue that uh, we're looking at with, um, with MAMA. Now I said that there are, um, uh, this is an issue that other, other galleries have been looking at. It's probably worth just um, being a bit more specific about that in terms of the different models and who's doing what. And this is not exhaustive, it's just some um, in, indicative models. So Shepparton Art Museum, which as you know, they're going through um, major development of, um, of, a, of a new gallery. I think that's currently standing as a, as a $39, $39 million investment. And um, a few years ago when they started on that journey, um, council made the decision to, uh, to set up an arm's length company limited by guarantee as the most appropriate operating model for that gallery. Um, in light of uh, some of the issues that I've just mentioned, some of the benefits that come with arms length arrangements. Um, up on the, uh, on the Gold Coast, um, where they've had a performing arts centre with a small gallery in it for uh, 25, 30 years, but are now uh, developing a, um, a larger cultural precinct around that, including a major new, a major new gallery as a component of it. That's, um, that is also operated by a, um, an arm's length company, but unusually it's a PTY limited. So there's two forms of company, the PTY limited, which is most familiar from small commercial operations and family businesses and so on, um, and company limited by guarantee. So in the PTY, you've got traditional shareholders who vote and, and control. And in the company limited by guarantee, the shareholders role is replaced by members, but they have the same function, except they don't receive share distributions or dividends. So that is um, uh, typically the model that's used in the not-for-profit sector. Um, and um, it, uh, on the Gold Coast, it's a PTY limited and council is the sole shareholder. So in the end, they control who's on the board and, and what happens, but they do it with a fairly hands-off approach on a day-to-day -day basis. The Brisbane Powerhouse has the same structure. Um, Geelong Art Gallery is operated um, at arm's length by a, by a separate organisation. Art Gallery Ballarat is a, is a, is, a, is a mix of entities. Um, they, uh, the gallery uh, is and collection owned by council. Um, they set up an arm's length company in order to um, establish um, a charitable structure that uh, could alongside a foundation receive donations and, and secure philanthropy. Um, but the staff are actually employed directly by, by council in that case. They may well be going through some changes now. And Rockhampton Art Gallery is run by um, owned and run by Rockhampton, uh, but they are currently looking at how they put the philanthropic element of that at arm's length from council um, because they're finding it a hindrance. In fact, some major foundations that have been willing to donate up to a million dollars have said, well, we won't under your current structure. We don't have to change it. Um, there was also a recent um, survey of, uh, of galleries in Australia that showed that um, uh, just over half are um, operated by local government and you can see the other stats on there so it's roughly half and half um, owned and operated by local government and the others many of which are owned by local government but operated um, at arm's length so just to look at some of the 
um, advantages and disadvantages of a company limited um, and a section, three, uh, a section 345 committee. Um, in the case of a company limited by guarantee, it can be um, uh, through it, uh, the wording in its constitution um, and its voting arrangements and putting it at arm's length from council, um, it can satisfy ACNC requirements um, to um, optimize philanthropic support, to be acceptable for, the, uh, for receiving donations. Um, it also generates donor confidence. I come across as a consultant uh, quite a lot of uh, probably misperceptions that if I give my money into a government structure as a private donor, who knows what's going to happen to it. And anyway, I don't want to be giving money to government in the first place. They've got enough money. So you've got these, you know, even if you get through the legal structure by setting up some appropriate vehicle, you're still dealing with perceptions that um, my money may not go where, it, where I really want it to. So you do, now that may be a prejudice, but it's, it's real from the donor's point of view and in a competitive marketplace, the risk is they'll just take the money somewhere else where they feel more comfortable. Um, uh, again, from a donor perspective, but others too, um, having a separate operation enables the costs and revenues to be much more clearly illustrated than when they're um, with, within a larger council, uh, council budgeting process. Um, now, you, you've partly got the benefit of a group of um, uh, pe specialists, people who are committed to the uh, welfare and well-being of the gallery um, through the um, advisory committee. But long term, having a, board, a governing board that has decision making authority attracts stronger people. Um, there are many people, business people or people very senior in the arts who won't want to get involved if they think, well, you know, I can always be ignored because we actually don't make, we don't have decision making authority. Then there is um, uh, the agility of the company, its ability to make decisions quickly outside council processes, but perhaps linked to council policies, which I will come back to in a moment. Um, now, even at arm's length, council can exert a high degree of control over a gallery or a performing arts centre through the funding agreement, through an approved strategic plan, through a services agreement about who does what, and through the terms of lease of an operating company is, uh, is granted a lease to run a gallery business within the building. And then turning to section 355 committee, um, I'm not gonna talk through all these in detail. Um, the, the last dot point is the critical dot point for the purposes of this dis discussion. It's not an arm's length arrangement. And for purposes of um, uh, perceptions of donors, um, as well as uh, ACNC registration of the gallery itself, um, a section 355 committee is not going to um, achieve those, um, those aims. It may be beneficial in terms of being easier to set up, not having any of the um, costs, although the costs are not very great for running a small company by guarantee. So it might, it might be an easier road in some ways, but it wouldn't satisfy, it wouldn't address those two needs. And it's probably worth noting that um, I've come across lots of galleries that are either companies limited or incorporated associations. I've never come across a gallery that's run under a section 355 committee arrangement. That may be my ignorance, but I haven't seen that um, out in the field. Um, so I fairly quickly came to the view that um, the preferred model, at least uh, my advice would be the preferred model is the company limited. Um, and that moves you on to dealing with, well, what is the right legal structure for that? What would be the nature of its board and the recruitment arrangements for the board? Who would own the assets and so on? So let me just talk very briefly about these points. Legal, legal structure, um, I've already covered it, would be company limited, registered with the ACNC. Um, and it would have the object of supporting the visual arts and education related to the visual arts. You obviously draft the objects reasonably broadly to make sure that it you don't cut off opportunities for activities the gallery might want to be involved in in the future. Um, the membership of that company, the controlling shareholders, as it were, um, if council can be the sole shareholder, that's the way you'd go. Um, if there are any reasons why it can't be registered with one sole member, then you just make sure that the that council um, uh, it has a controlling number of um, of, uh, of members to make sure that in the end it can always direct what it. Uh, what it wants in terms of uh, the future of the gallery. Um, the, uh, the board would be cus custom built um, to be effective in running a gallery, business skills, um, some gallery or visual arts knowledge, 
education skills, perhaps even you know, uh, uh, other skills that are, uh, that are relevant. Asset ownership at this stage, I wouldn't see a reason to um, separate the ownership of the gallery or the collection from council. There might be reasons in the long term why putting it out into a separate trust or something could be advantageous. For example, if there was some multi-million dollar capital fundraising campaign, and that was going to assist in terms of um, the, the look and feel of, of, of the assets. Again, people worrying about giving money into uh, local governments. But at this stage, I don't think that needs to be addressed. The lease would be very specific, about, I mean, maybe a three or five year lease or, or a longer lease, but um, as, long as, council, as, as long as council is comfortable with. Um, but it would specify the nature of the business that can be run in this, um, in the building. Um, that's the arrangement, for example, at Salamanca Arts Centre down in Hobart, where it's quite precise um, what the operating company can do in that building. The funding agreement, we give the gallery one and a half million or more dollars per year. And in return, it has to provide the following specified services. And the strategic plan, which you'd sign off on, would amplify upon that, and that'd be a you know, periodic plan for probably three or four years. The services agreement, there'd be a lot of functions that are currently fulfilled within council, um, payroll and financial services and procurement and maintenance and a whole range of other things. Some of those um, under the company limited should be run perhaps directly by um, the, the gallery's new management and board. Um, some of them might stay with council, but through a sort of buyback arrangement, it would be part of the financial arrangements between um, council and the gallery, but it needs to be laid out very, very clearly as with the reporting and accountability arrangements, how is an arm's length operation going to report into council, how frequently and in what format. Um, and um, I think this is uh, my final slide. Um, this is a proposed staged approach for implementation. I think if you're going for this model, you should introduce the model wholesale, not a, a bit of it and try a bit more later because it probably won't work on that basis. Um, in fact, I would probably recommend that during a transition period, you have a quasi board sort of virtual entity um, already starting to operate like a board. And it might be that some members of the current advisory committee would go into that um, sort of transitional board along with a couple of new board members uh, to provide a really smooth transition through the period of one or two years that this might, uh, that this might take. Um, so the first step is council um, considering this proposal and, um, and uh, adopting it or adopting it with amendments. Um, and then early, ne early 2021, positive solutions or another, preparing a more detailed transition plan for how to make it all happen and over what, uh, over what period. Um, there's some discussion to have about the relationship between this new entity and the Art Foundation. Um, and then the transition plan and the detailed proposed arrangements would come back to would come back to council for uh, consideration and sign off. Um, so I think that's I think that's me done, <laughs> and I will stop um, screen sharing if that's okay, so I can see you. <laughs> Thanks very much, David. Um, thorough presentation. C questions from councillors. Councillor Thurley. It's not so much a question because I've heard the um, presentation before. I'm on the advisory board. Um, my view straight up is that a Section 355 committee is not the way to go. Um, it barely separates uh, the gallery from council and there are a lot of people who want to see at least an arm's length approach. Um, if we're going to attract major philanthropic donation, the people want to know their money goes to the gallery, not to the council. And that is always a problem when you have these galleries run by council. So I fully commend the idea of a company limited by guarantee. And I think the timetable we saw on the last slide, uh, we're just required to make a decision in uh, December, at the December council meeting, to give the go ahead that this plan now be stepped out in great detail. Um, so I, I, I would certainly support that. Thank you. Any other questions, councillors? Councillor Conn. Uh, thanks, Mr Mayor. Uh, through you to the presenter, please. Um, your slide had the two models to compare, being either a company limited guarantee or, or a section um, 355 committee. But earlier in the presentation, you sort of briefly touched past having a proprietary limited 
business structure um, with one shareholder being the council. Um, why wasn't that then in the comparison later or why was that not considered at all? There, um, thanks for the question, Councillor Kong. Um, there are only, as far as I'm aware, a uh, couple of arts organisations in Australia that have actually made that choice. And I think the reason for that is because people think of a proprietary limited as a commercial operation. So it presents another barrier you don't need to be facing, which is people saying, well, hang, hang on, isn't that, don't they distribute dividends? Now the constitution could be set up so that dividend distribution is precluded, even in a PTY limited. But it just raises eyebrows. Even the ACNC would say, well, how come you've gone for that? That's, that's typically a commercial structure. So that's why I didn't bother with it, only because there's no advantage from it, um, other than the fact that possibly some people from the business community and perhaps even people from within council who are out in the business community as well, they know PTYs, they may indeed be a shareholder in a PTY, their own family company. So you know, in one or two cases, that's why it's happened. But, um, but there's, um, in the not-for-profit sector, um, there are about, um, 130, 140,000 incorporated not-for-profits in Australia, about 100,000 100, incorporated associations. Those are really generally much smaller charitable organisations. Um, there's about 30,000 companies limited by guarantee and there's a handful of PTY limiteds. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Con. Uh, David, just one from me in relation to, you stated that 60% of council uh, regional galleries are owned by councils. Uh, in terms of that number, what percentage are actually committees or uh, um, the, the recommended um, option, which I, I do support as well? Um, so uh, most of these galleries, and it may be 90%, are government owned, mostly local government owned. Obviously, they're also state, state owned galleries. There's very, very few that are um, in independently um, owned. There are exceptions. Um, uh, Tarawara, the winery, the Beeson family built their own gallery. There's a few examples of major philanthropists going down that uh, uh, going down that road, but mostly they're owned by by local uh, by local government. Um, the um, uh, the majority of those that are owned by local government, and I would say it's still uh, it's still a significant majority, are also um, operated by uh, by local government. But the trend is now um, away from that. That earlier slide also pointed to the fact that about fourteen percent of galleries are owned and operated by universities, and there's you know there's just a couple of percent that are independent. So. Gov local government owned and operated is still the majority model, but everybody's struggling with it because of this issue of philanthropy and perceptions. And to some degree, um, and this may not be a big issue, but to, uh, in some cases, it's frustrations that council processes and running an arts organisation's processes, they don't align well in terms of speed of decision making and so on. Um, so what's a, uh, you know, a better model that a lot of people have concluded is have a very clear framework in terms of policies, funding agreements and so on. But within that framework, let the gallery's management go and get on with the job. Um, and um, so it is, so this is, a, this is a growing trend, but it's not the majority yet. Okay, thank you. Uh, and I'd also like to acknowledge Janet Osmond is in the, uh, in the group. Janet's the new chair of the MAMA Advisory Committee, soon to be bored by the sound of it. So no, there are no further questions. So thanks, David, and thanks to Simona and, and um, Barry for being here. And thank you again, Janet, for being here. And uh, we, uh, we wish you all the best. Thank you. Thank you very much for your time. <laughs> okay, P PMBS 5, which is the Albury City Compliance Priorities Program. Kate Dehannon. Thank you very much, Mayor Matt. You there pretty quick. You're pretty quick. <laughs> Thanks very much, Mayor Mac. And tonight, yes, I will be speaking on our draft compliance priorities program and seeking your feedback. Uh, given that there's a number of councillors missing tonight, I would like to uh, offer this feedback session for another week after this meeting. So I'll send something out by email and then others can um, provide some comments afterwards. So about this time last year, uh, we presented the compliance and enforcement framework uh, and that was subsequently adopted. So this compliance priorities program sits underneath that umbrella. The program's also being developed in response to an audit that was conducted and is also in line with the New South Wales Ombudsman's guidelines as well. 
Um, and we, we've come to you tonight for your feedback because we want this program to commence in 1 January in, in 2021. So there's a number of points there. I'm not going to read out each one, um, just I'm cognizant of time. However, what we're really trying to do here, by, if I summed up those six points, if push comes to shove when we make, need to make a decision on which compliance area we're going to focus on or, or where we need to, to move quickly, by having one of these programs and having our priorities determined, we can actually then, we've got a decision criteria which is transparent and actually supports our, our decision and where we're going to go. So um, certainly that, that first point, what we're looking at is our existing activities, but it's also, it will guide our decision-making, but it's actually formulated from all the work that we've done in the past, from the compliance activity that we've done for the last 12 months, it's gonna help formulate the new compliance priorities program for the next year. Um, it, it certainly allows us to be very transparent having one of these programs and we haven't had one here at Aubrey City before. I've put a big important sticker on this because I want to ensure, assure everybody here that in no way is this going to interfere with us addressing every compliance activity that comes across our desk every customer request that comes across our desk, we will still address um, to the highest commitment to our community. But what this program will do is just prioritise those activities. Um, it'll allow us to still continue to meet all of our compliance activity, but it's just prioritising the events should we have to make a decision on which way to go and which to respond to ahead of something else. We're being transparent in where that focus will lie. Um, in no way is it going to to mean we don't address something just because it's not on the list. Importantly, the Compliance Priorities Program isn't just something we make up in our heads. It's absolutely informed by the statistics from the year prior, engagement with yourselves, the counsellors, our service leaders, our team leaders, and engagement out in the community. Our engagement with the community has come forth due to the community requests. Plus you'll also see that a tremendous amount of our compliance activity comes from companion animals. So that will be um, engaged through our companion animals advisory panel and the upcoming companion animals management plan. So our compliance priorities program it is not plucked out of the air. It's something that's driven wholly and solely by our stats and our engagement. A really important slide for you to see here is that the community request we've received from the 1st of November 2019 until pretty much now, 31 October 2020. Um, straight away, you can see dogs um, do present a lot of our um, customer requests coming in. And just for your own information, the environmental ranges section, the 506 there, that's about firewood, long grass, berm permits, littering, um, illegal camping, that covers that off. The environmental public health covers things like residential noise, odour, on-site sewer, hoarding and public swimming pools. The environmental compliance section talks about stormwater runoff, tree removal, dust and pollution. So I just wanted to break those down so ensure you, you knew exactly what those components were, were driven from. So in summary, we've received nearly three and a half thousand customer requests in the last year that our, that our compliance um, officers, development compliance officers and rangers will follow up on and have followed up on. The 92 dog attacks, I just wanted to specify there, that doesn't mean that, that someone's been bitten or someone's, um, it's been some ferocious attack. It could be one dog running at another dog. So that certainly um, doesn't need to involve a bite. Abandoned vehicle reports, not all of those end up being abandoned vehicles. Often they're just someone who's parked out in front of, of, of a premise and has been there for some time. And then, as I said, those two things, all things environment, the ones I just read out before, plus companion animals make up by far the lion's share of community requests that we follow up. In addition to that 3,300 or so um, requests, we then do about 300 
routine food inspections and our potable water testing as well every week. So what we've done to date and what I'd like to receive your feedback on tonight and then over the next week is that we have met with each of the service leaders and we've gone through our statistics and we've asked them, of all things we've just considered, what would you consider our proposed priorities for the next calendar year, commencing January 1? So this is what's come back to us from our service leaders to date and this is what I'm presenting to you, yourselves, councillors, tonight to get your feedback as, as do you think this aligns with, with your way of thinking? Um, sh do you have an item that you think should be higher up the list? Again, um, emphasising that if it's not on the list, it doesn't mean it will not be addressed. Likewise, a low item does not mean it will not be addressed. It will absolutely be addressed. But if we need to pick and choose as to which we do first, we've got a transparent program which actually says what which way we'll be going on that. So this is where we're at at the moment, but I would like to, I would like to receive your feedback on that. Councillor Vanderman, have you got a question while we're getting feedback? You're all turned off. Uh, sorry, yeah, I'm uh, happy to uh, finish the presentation and then provide the feedback, but... Uh... No worries, thank you. This is actually the last slide, so yep. I just wanted the two up side by side, so I'm happy to receive some feedback. Thank you. No, you're right now, Councillor Vanderman, last slide. Okay, you can... so, so a couple of priorities from my perspective, and it's something that really annoys people in our community. Uh, one is um, uh, parking in disabled parking spots. And I, and I really do believe that that needs to be given uh, some high priority. Um, because the there are uh, regulations around how many spots we have to provide. And if people don't, um, you know, uh, give those spots their due consideration when they're parking, I think it's not fair on the people that need to, need to have those spots. So that's one issue that I'd like to have uh, separated out, if you like, in terms of the parking and have a focus on, uh, you know, parking in disabled uh uh, spaces without the proper authority. The other one is obviously from some feedback over the, the last 12 or 18 months around uh, compliance with uh, uh, environmental uh, impacts of demolition of buildings in terms of asbestos um, that has raised its ugly head a couple of times. And I personally would like to see uh, a real focus on uh, on those activities to make sure that our community isn't subjected to, um, you know, dangers that they, they needn't be subjected to because people aren't doing the right thing. Thank you. Councillor Thurley. Thank you. Um, Kate, will we get the presentation? Because yes. I don't have it. Okay. Um, because I'd like to have a think about it Great. and give some feedback. Um, but in general terms, what you've put up there sounds pretty good to me. Um, I did like your uh, thing about a dog attack did not, does not by definition require a bite because years ago I was attacked by a dog. I, dis I was knocked over and had my shoulder dislocated. And when I um, went to the owners, they told me that I'd just fallen over and the dog hadn't attacked me. Um, about $20,000 later, they realised that I was in the right and they were in the wrong. Any other questions, Councillor Con? Sorry, used my green card because it's a comment, not a question. Yeah. Um, I'm I'm quite happy with the priorities that have been identified as high. Um, I made my own little notes. So, so personally, my top three priorities would be the environmental compliance, the COVID compliance, and the dogs. Um, I've had a lot of feedback from people who use. Um, recreational spaces and sensitive environmental spaces and the dogs off lead, um, whether that's um, disrupting other people's activities or disturbing wildlife um, is raised with me a lot. Um, and then um, I think the they're in the right order because we're looking at the seriousness of the outcome um, as well as just how commonly these things occur. Um, so I'm happy to support the, the draft as is. Thank you. Councillor Glocken. 
Uh, th thank you. I support Amanda's uh, comments about the uh, COVID-19 uh, initiatives and um, raising awareness in our community and being really proactive for a couple of reasons. Uh, one is because um, we often hear of uh, people around town doing the wrong thing, but there's no one there to pull them up and, you know, there's only so many police. And so I think the more people we have reminding everyone of what they should and shouldn't be doing is, is very important. And it's um, uh, little things like the hand sanitising, the number of people who I now see going to mm. places and they, they think they don't have to use that anymore. So they just bypass the hand sanitizer. The number of people, uh, business people or supposed leaders in our community shaking hands at official events or functions. Um, and, I, and I appreciate that some of that is hard if someone puts their hand out and you're not expecting it to resist taking that hand. So maybe um, some of that could be um, promoted and it's okay to say, I can't shake your hand type of thing. Um, and also, um, you know, lining up outside the queues at the pubs and clubs. Um, when the pubs have their security car guards, they're at the door. I know they should be walking back and reminding everyone that they should not be, you know, a metre and a half. They should be outside, you know, greater than a metre and a half from the other group. But that's not happening. Um, and I... And I understand that it's very hard for the security guards to be checking people in but also monitoring at the same time so I think if we could if we could raise that awareness uh, be really more proactive in that space that would be really good so and, and I thought that was good if Councillor Conda picked that up yeah thank you thanks Councillor Doxy thank you Mr Mayor very quickly uh, do we consider the uh, alcohol-free zones in this particular one or not? No, no, we don't. I got the answer I wanted. Thank you. Uh, I think they're actually policed by the police, Jerome, as, um, as our uh, representatives. Just for me, Kate, um, in relation to this prioritisation, what are the numbers you have at your disposal within the compliance team? Could you just give me an update on that for a start? We've got six ranges. Is that and two development compliance No, sorry, Mr Mack. We've got uh, the team leader and then six ranges. Okay. And are they all um, are they all trained across every discipline that you've put on the board? That's correct. So... Uh, it was raised in this chamber a few years ago um, and there has been a distinct change in our approach to parking and parking was raised in this chamber about Swift Street when we put the roundabout, the um, pedestrian crossing there. Parking was again raised tonight about disability parking, which I fully support. I think too much of that goes on and there's not enough attention to it. But all those things considered, um, the smart parking trial, uh, when is that? I can't recall offhand when that was it's planned to be uh, implemented. Uh, if it's in this 12 month period, then it has to be allowed for, or if it's not, then it doesn't have to be. But are there adequate resources to maintain vigilance over all these areas? Because I understand there's a lot of work to be done. Thanks for your question, Mr. Mayor. The Smart parking, so you're referring to the parking sensors. Yeah, that's certainly well underway now. We are working back with the um, approved provider. Uh, we're working back with the ticketing machines, all of that. It will be in this financial year that we start to make some progress on that, but we're waiting on them for the impl implementation of the time frame. Okay, no worries. So you've got adequate resources to maintain adequate vigilance in all those, in all those areas? I feel that we do. Um, Councillor Vandervan's comment regarding disabled parking, what we did right through COVID when a lot of things dropped away, we still had a very strong focus on those red zone areas, which includes that disability parking. So we, we do intend to ensure that we have the resources up to maintain a vigilance across all these areas. And I probably think dog, dog attacks were probably on a rise because people were walking their dogs without leases too. So there's a whole range of things that's happened, happened since we've been in a different space during the pandemic. Okay, thank you. Any other questions, councillors? No? Thanks, Kate. Thanks for your report. Okay. Um, we have now got... 
we've got the COVID-19 relief and recovery update, Miss Squire. And if anyone wants to have a quick break after that, just let me know and uh, we'll organise for a couple of minutes. Thanks, Grace, Mr Mayor. Thank you. Thank you. Um, just providing councillors with a bit of a snapshot update on where things are at at the moment. Um, as you're aware, we've been working across these five pillars through the whole relief and recovery process, uh, which is certainly ongoing, um, as indicated by the Mayor before. In terms of financial assistance, um, as you can see there, residential debt management as at October, um, the number of rate pay payers that have requested payment deferral and those that are on plans and the outstanding amounts are not dissimilar to previous years. Uh, so we're still seeing similar trends track tracking along. Uh, in terms of the hardship relief program, we've had 93 applications in total and we finalised 83 of those. Uh, and to date, we've paid or we've agreed on relief of 32,000 uh, to those applicants. Um, keeping track of your best mate program, I think I updated councillors previously that we'd moved to a in-home service. Uh, that's been really, really welcomed by the community. We've had 136 registrations received. Uh, the online registration system is working really well, albeit that members of the community can ring up customer service and, and book in if they don't have online facilities anyway. Uh, but certainly we're seeing a really good take up of that. Normally we do two day initiatives each year and we have about 200 people. Um, that actually get their pets registered microchip through that process. So our goal was to, to reach 200 um, and certainly we're working well toward that, which is fantastic. In terms of how we're keeping our community connected, um, Council certainly granted funding to Carevan and Foodshare through its uh, Community and Cultural Grants Program. The Retro Cafes extended hours of operation and we're trialling some sessions uh, hangout sessions there on Thursdays. We've also been working with restaurants that might have limited street uh, frontage for outdoor dining uh, to expand those. Thank you, Councillor Glacken, uh, for making that suggestion. And that, that's been very well received as well. Uh, our community development team have been providing facilitation support for a number of Aboriginal memorial gatherings at Mungabarina. There's a lot of support that people in the community need that you don't necessarily think about. Uh, so our focus has been on being responsive um, and, and providing support wherever we can, whatever the circumstances might bring. Certainly our food inspection fees have been waived through to the 30th of June. Uh, and restrictions on indoor and outdoor gatherings have eased, which has allowed us to increase capacity and, and support greater community connection at some of our venues, which has been fabulous. Um, and we've also provided some financial support to the Young Aboriginal Mixed Rugby Touch Team um, in partnership with the Aubrey Police. Uh, in terms of keeping our community up to date on COVID, certainly the community is still utilising our COVID-19 webpage uh, as a source of truth and that then is redirecting them to a range of other uh, information providers uh, with over nearly 25,000 views, which is fantastic. We have increased our focus on reminding the community um, to follow those public health orders, you know, to apply social distancing, good hygiene practices, and really work to try and keep each other safe. Uh, so we have tried to do more in that space. Certainly increasing social media content across the board. Uh, we have also supported the Aubrey Liquor Accord with their social distancing campaign. Uh, and Councillor Glacken, just to your point uh, before about the lineups um, at, at pubs and clubs, certainly I'm happy to have a chat with our community safety officer and perhaps suggest through the liquor accord, that might just be another thing that some of those venues might be able to do to, to help uh, along the way. Um, certainly all our venues are displaying government health advice uh, and we are also looking at a program of rolling out some additional signage in sort of key public spaces and areas just for general awareness and as that constant reminder to the community, recognising that COVID-19 is going to be with us for some time yet. Um, 
And I guess the other important thing is the tourism reactivation marketing program um, and the initiatives that we're running under that. In terms of events, some of the changes to restrictions have allowed us to start to reactivate, which has been fantastic. Uh, MIGS got going and we had our second event uh, on Sunday, which was fantastic. And we are looking at an additional event in December. So we don't normally host a Music in the Gardens event in December, but certainly looking to do it this year, given that it is something that we can actually do. Uh, we've been working with the Chamber and Aubrey CBD on the Christmas in Our Hearts program, which really is about activating our CBD areas across the city. Um, you know, certainly we won't be having our large scale carols by candlelight with 10,000 people in the square, but we're looking at more of a staggered program over a couple of weeks to really encourage people to go out and about, but to do so safely. Uh, and create environments where you're not going to get large scale public gatherings. Um, and it really is about encouraging people to shop and eat and, and celebrate the city, but in a COVID safe manner. We're also working with uh, the winemakers of Rutherglen who are really keen to bring their event back. So um, for those of you that might have gone to the last one, they had Rutherglen in the city. And working through the detail of what that might look like in a COVID safe way, uh, but that might be a, another good event to really allow people to come together and connect. Uh, in terms of our facilities, we have seen an increasing number of flights coming into the airport, which is a positive sign. Um, and we are seeing increasing numbers of, of passengers as well. Uh, which is fantastic. The requirement to temperature screen passengers at the airport will be removed from the 23rd of November, uh, which I'm sure um, will be appreciated by passengers, but also obviously logistically, it won't require the same level of management and coordination. Uh, noting that that could change at any time if circumstances change, uh, but certainly we've got experience in supporting those agencies undertaking that service. At Lauren Jackson Sports Centre, we've had more than 20 new teams join competitions uh, and we have extended our opening hours due to demand. Uh, and the Aubrey Entertainment Centre, with the changes to restrictions, um, are now able to, the theatre can operate up to 50% capacity uh, and we've got some fantastic performances booked moving forward and the tickets have sold extremely well. So I think people in the community are really keen to get out. Um, but certainly we are applying, um, when we're doing bookings, we're actually seating different groups. We're providing separation between those groups when those bookings are made and coordinated with a view to obviously spreading people uh, safely throughout the venue in line with the public health orders. Uh, in terms of supporting business, uh, we have been working with the Chamber on the Go Local First campaign. Uh, which has been working really well. We've had more than 2,000 social media users engage on that. Uh, and also the uh, gift card program, um, which Carrick touched on in his presentation. Evo Jobs, um, and if you look at these trends, it's interesting. We're seeing more jobs posted on Evo Jobs, but less of viewers. Uh, so certainly there's jobs out there that people are looking to fill. Um, you know, whether the jobs viewed is as a result or the decrease in the number of jobs viewed is as a result of the fact that, you know, people are starting to return to work or perhaps have more certainty about their work than what they did back in July. Um, but noting also that Evo Cities and Evo Jobs doesn't have an active advertising program in market at the present time, but nevertheless, uh, we're still seeing users spending, you know, four to five minutes on that website, uh, which indicates that they are certainly serious uh, job hunters or new city dwellers. Uh, job seeker and youth allowance. So across all Rewadonga, we've seen a minor decrease in terms of those that are requiring job seeker and youth allowance support. Uh, but obviously the numbers are still quite high, but at least it's heading in the right direction, which is a positive. Uh, in terms of grants and financial assistance, um, Council will be aware there's a range of programs that have been rolled out, um, both to Council and the broader community. Uh, I think importantly, the, small, the Southern Border Small Business Support Grant, uh, in total, there's been about 15 million paid 
uh, by the government. Uh, I think they've got applications for about 18.2 million. Aubrey businesses, there's been 831 applications uh, and certainly we those businesses have been granted nearly $6 million. So that program has provided a lot of support to local businesses and recognising that those grants are only $5,000 or $10,000. So yeah, it's it is it is quite significant. Um, I won't run through all those because I think the council councillors are mostly aware of those. Uh, what I will say, the New South Wales Regional Job Creation Fund, which was announced by the New South Wales government a few weeks ago, has stimulated a lot of investor interest uh, and interest from existing businesses looking to expand. So our economic development team are working in partnership with Regional Development New South Wales. Uh, to support those people through that process. Um, in terms of emergency response and in-kind support, uh, we have provided a range of in-kind assistance over the course of, of COVID, but certainly more recently, uh, providing the Lavington Hall, uh, accommodating care van at Mirambina, and then also the terminal staff and the work they've done to assist uh, the police with the passenger screening. Uh, in terms of where we're at with our people, um, so we still do have one person uh, who is on a hybrid uh, job retention allowance just due to the nature of their work. Um, but predominantly, most of our people have returned to work. We've got 50 people still working from home fully, uh, but we have 99 that are on more of a hybrid um, and, and returning to work sort of arrangement. Um, as we've touched on previously, until such time as the public health orders that are given by the New South Wales and Victorian government no longer in include that requirement that people work from home where they can, uh, we will continue to support our people working from home. Um, and that's working well for us at the moment. Customer service centre inquiries remain fairly consistent over the time. Uh, visitor information uh, data, again, relatively consistent, although we have seen quite a drop off to visit Aubrey Wodonga uh, in October, uh, which has been really interesting. And whether that's, you know, that people have made their plans or their focus is shifting to visiting friends and families in the short term with restrictions easing and borders starting to open up. Um, but overall, um, certainly all of that information is, is provided for them. Uh, in terms of Wigira trail visitors, so this is based on the sensors that are located at Kramer Street uh, just before you start on the Indamara sculpture walk. Uh, so as you can see here, the blue is 2019 and the green is 2020. Uh, so demand for our public spaces and particularly those riverside walks and experiences uh, has increased significantly uh, over the course of COVID. Uh, the other important information is the, the rate of development applications. The economic stimulus that's being provided by the federal government is having a direct flow on effect um, in terms of the number of applications that are coming in, uh, which is positive from an economic point of view and, and great to see that the economy um, will be buoyed by that over time. Uh, and as you can see here, when you look at the value as well, in comparison with previous years, uh, we're certainly still tracking um, along with a really positive trend, which is fantastic in terms of economic sustainability. Okay, that's it for me, Mr. Mayor. Happy to take any questions if anyone has any. Thanks, Ms. Squire. Councillor Glycan. Thank you. Two things, if I may. First, uh, one is a comment and perhaps a re request. Um, the slides, and I noticed it last time but and thought it was a bit odd but didn't say anything about it. The Evo City slides, mm. there's a couple and they go, the information goes from right to left this way, but the visitor information and the other all go from left to right. And it's just a little confusing. Thanks, Councillor Glacken. Thank we you. can fix that for you. Um, the, uh, in fact, I read them completely incorrectly last time. I wondered why certain figures were the way they were. I picked it up this time. Um, with regards to uh, 
reactivating the city uh, and the concept of the smaller Christmas festival or, or the smaller Christmas festival over an extended period of time, is it possible to include or collaborate with the Aubrey Band and the Scots Band to put on some uh, performances in QE2 uh, and maybe some at the gardens as well on the basis that we do uh, support them, um, but also because it would be good to get them out and performing at uh, things because I can well imagine that a lot of the things that they would traditionally have been performing at over the year has decreased um, and maybe some smaller uh, type bands might be good and if we could advertise that more broadly to the sector of the community who would be particularly interested in that, um, uh, perhaps um, the, the more senior people in our community, if that's possible, uh, just as a, a suggestion of something maybe we could do to include that group. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any other question, councillors? Uh, Trace, just from me, in relation to um, the hardship money, was that mm. 32000 has been issued out of the $3 million that's been set aside? That's correct. The Mr. $3 million didn't include the street fees and, and commercial fees, did it? That was separate, wasn't it? It was separate, Mr Mayor. So when Council adopted the budget, it included in that was waiving a number of fees mm. and charges, which wasn't yeah. reflected Except in the, the three, $3 million. Okay. Yeah. So or, when will that be um, up for discussion and, and potential um, revision? Yeah, uh, certainly the September quarterly budget review will come to you uh, in November, but perhaps in December when we do the December quarter review, um, I guess we are conscious of the fact that the JobKeeper funding is going to end mm. at the end of March unless the government changes its view. Uh, but certainly there may be an opportunity depending on um, you know, where, what our financial position looks like at the December review to even consider reducing that $3 million down to a level that still provides capacity to support the community if and when it's needed, yeah. uh, but at an extent or to a level that is perhaps more in line with the sorts of requests that we're receiving. Okay. Thank yeah. you. Okay. Thank you, councillors. Thanks, Trace. Uh, just have a couple of minutes if you like and... We'll be back.
And Frank, what's the ex expected length of time that this three meeting budget preparation is gonna go for? Okay. I'm just trying to, I've got a, I've got a uh, job to do. I've got to pick up some hoses in Wodonga. Um, so I just wanted to get a time frame. Yeah, no worries. Thank you. See ya. Is it a place somewhere? Welcome back, everyone. Uh, resumption with Mr. Finlayson with our budget development strategy and priority setting. Thanks, Justin. Very good. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So uh, following on from the last briefing session where we talked about how the process went last time around, now we're looking ahead and how we'll go about it this time around. So 
um, a number of things to cover off on the integrated planning reporting framework strategic priorities that have been identified to date the preparation timetable and principles and parameters which will guide our process so as we've seen before we have the our community strategic plan which we're working towards as part of part of our four-year delivery program and our first year being the operational plan and uh, we'll provide some feedback regarding pr delivery program priorities received so far. So our community strategic plan, Aubrey 2030, identifies that our vision being a nationally significant regional city that is vibrant, innovative, connected, and inspired by its culture, environment, and location on the Murray River. The community strategic plan uh, is, covers four themes and supported by each of those themes are strategic outcomes and actions. Uh, then Aubrey City ourselves, we have our strategic business objectives or corporate success pillars um, covering off those six key areas. So in terms of priorities received from councillors to date, um, I'll just uh, run through them. So World War II Memorial Bowl upgrades with the uh, children's play space and exercise space, as well as solar lighting along the path up to the memorial. Uh, carbon reduction initiatives aligning with the recently identified targets. Identification for a public open space in the Lavington CBD and also progressing the Lavington CBD bike loop. Other priorities received include the feasibility study for the naturalization of the Bungamboratha Creek and the implementation of the mountain biking strategy once completed, the urban forest strategy and the continuation of our community energy fund and con consider expanding the fund. In terms of the CBD pop-up outdoor dining retail busking in on street areas as part of a COVID stimulus recovery initiatives. Progressing implement implementation of the River Arena Hi Highway Corridor strategy, with the priority being the airport entry roundabout. Barella Road River Arena Highway works, and also Walsh Street reconstruction, including footpaths. Uh, other priorities include benchmarking the utilisation and performance of our maintenance and construction crews, uh, reviewing the Works Depot initiative with a view of consolidating all depots in the East Albury site, and on a similar vein, relocating the Wodonga Place Depot operations to enable future development of that site. Other uh, initiatives include utilising and improving the look of rail land in the heart of Aubrey, developing the Young Street land and identifying other Aubrey City underutilized land that could be sold to be developed by others. Escalating community safety and crime prevention activities, bringing the master planning of the Greenfield Park change rooms and grandstand forward and uh, identifying and funding Now Can Hill mountain bike loop initiatives, such, including toilet facilities, facilitating the planning of the Murray River Experience Boulevard stage one as a stage project, strategic land acquisitions in Thaguna Walinga Growth Corridor by Aubrey City, and establishing the Thaguna Link Road connections to Davy Road interchange. Uh, and last but not least, uh, ensure timely completion of key master and strategic plans to guide future decision-making and investment. So they're the priorities that have been um, suggested by councillors to date and happy to take on additional priorities, whether that's uh, this evening or um, subsequent to this meeting to inform the next steps, which I'll go through now. So in terms of councillor briefing sessions, we're looking to come back to you in February with how we plan to progress those suggestions received and then build them into our draft budget documentation, which will also be briefed on in the March and April briefing sessions. Uh, then they'll go through the formal process with the draft budget presented to council in April next year, community consultation, public submissions received, 
and then those analysis of those submissions presented to the council for final adoption in June 21. Uh, the principles that we'll use, as we've used in previous years, in focusing on strategic priorities, including Aubrey 2030, achieving break even operating results in each of the funds where we can, continue to identify efficiencies and savings, optimizing grant funding opportunities, continuing to plan for the renewal of assets, part funding our capital works program through borrowings, and delivering our projects on time and within budget. In terms of some budget parameters that we'll look to use when um, building the budget, the rate peg's been set by IPART at 2% for that 21-22 year. Uh, there's no planned increase to the domestic waste management charges. However, there will be the reversal of the one-off reduction of 40 years, 40 years, $40 in the current year. Uh, there's no planned increases for water and sewer fees while we're progressing the integrated water cycle management strategy. Uh, and fees and charges, as in previous years, in any increases will be subject to market competitiveness and also our community's utilisation of those assets. And there's no planned increase to the waste management gate fee for mixed waste up to 100 kilograms. On the expense side, the, the award increase is set at 2%. Um, and the payroll budget will be based on our endorsed operational structure, organisational structure at the time. And any business case is, must be endorsed by the executive to be included in our organisational structure. So next steps, we're looking to come back to you, as I mentioned in February, to provide further detail on how we can progress the, your suggestions and feedback received. Um, and so thank you and open to any feedback and suggestions to further inform that process, including strategic priorities. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Justin. Councillor Conn. Thanks. I'm just wondering if we can all please be sent the full list as an email. Um, obviously, some of those I've seen before because they were mine, but it's my first look at the things submitted by the councillors and it'd be good to have the time to go through them um, as a whole. The presentation is on your um, docs on tap. It's a full list, as I understand, isn't it, uh, Mr. Finlayson, this, on the presentation? Yes, that's correct. That um, Currently, the presentation includes all the suggestions mm. received so far. Yeah, but historically, when we've done this, you know, we used to do the dots and things. We used to sort of follow, we used to submit our own and then follow that up with a bit of a discussion or feedback, et cetera. I'm just hoping there's a step two with this. Through you, Mr. Chair, I'm happy to receive any feedback and discussion from councillors, but in terms of... Uh, prioritisation uh, as in the prior year we're not looking to do that step in the process but work with the councillor group on how to progress on, on the priorities received. Okay. Any so other if questions? I think someone else's idea was good we can't give it any additional priority. They're all priorities Mr Chair. They're all priorities Councillor Con. apparently. Any other questions? Just one from me, Justin. There is a lot of projects, and to take Councillor Con's point it to uh, to the discussion. In terms of previous year, there has been a, a um, coloured dot uh, process, which, whether it was right or wrong, um, was about what priorities or what 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 the favoured position of every councillor was in terms of a majority. Um, just from me, in relation, there's two things that I, I'd like to see. And it's it's a, it's a basically a business requirement that, that there's financial balance, and the timing, and a lot of those projects with Davy Road for what just an example, and the Davy Road um, development, how that impacts upon the next steps in terms of the development of the internal um, requirements for residential roads and activity in that space, that's in there, uh, and just those particular projects, if if we could get visibility of that balance. Do you see what I'm saying? Because then it's not a scattergun approach. And there's other stuff in there that uh, Miss Guy probably can probably value add to in terms of other spaces, uh, in terms of land acquisition and, and current land availability that could be done in a more uh, a confidential setting, which could allay some of the concerns in relation to that space. There's, there's a, the stuff that I saw up there is great. I like it all. And as Amanda said, it's really important to have that well, 
when do we determine what is the priority? And we can't, as you say, from a balanced perspective, financial balance, but from a community perspective, we also need to deliver on whole projects, not just have a scattergun approach. I like them all. And like everything else, Christmas time, we want every present, but we can't have them all. So just give, that's just my, my feedback. I just think they're all great projects. And I commend the, the work the councillors have done in providing that, with that feedback. And some are a lot cheaper than others too. And some are just procedural and operational. So so if we, if we could sort of see that sort of presented in February, and if the councillors want to do want to provide feedback on what they've seen on the slides and if there are any other priorities that might um, support those particular projects, I'm uh, Justin more than happy to take that feedback as well. Okay, thanks, Justin. Thanks for your presentation. Well, well done. Okay, uh, we're up to the uh, CBD parking special rate review. Thanks, Justin. Thank you. Uh, me again. <laughs> uh, so, uh, yes, we're in the process of reviewing our Aubrey CBD parking special rate as a follow-on from the CBD parking strategy development. There we go. So as background, our special rate is uh, generated in accordance with the local government act. It's applied to Aubrey CBD business properties and it raises funds to um, maintain existing car parking areas within central Aubrey. So in terms of the number of properties, there are 444 business properties in the CBD that contribute to the, the maintenance of parking. Uh, the amount charged is based on the unimproved land value and in total that generates in the order of $550,000 per year, uh, which per property is in the equivalent of $1,240 per, uh, per annum. So in terms of the area, the area on the left you can see is the, the, the CBD business properties that are captured by the special rate. In comparison is a map taken from the CBD parking strategy, uh, which highlights that um, there's probably some room for review in terms of the footprint of the, the special rate. In terms of the uh, and some indicative examples, large shopping centres contribute in the order of $6,000 to $16,000, depending on their land value. Clubs, $8,000 to $16,000, and motels, $890 to $8,000. The special rate, just as our ordinary rates, are governed by the rate peg and um, the rate peg covers both as one, as a pool, and it's been our practice to increase the special rate in accordance with the rate peg year on year. And so, and the amount that's generated through the special rate is equivalent of 1.2% of the total ordinary and special rates combined that Aubrey City collects each year. Uh, there was a previous budget submission from a group of motels that raised concerns regarding uh, the cost of contributing to public parking within the CBD, as well as their uh, responsibility to provide on-site parking to their guests and how they felt that their guests didn't benefit from both. Um, and so in response that we said we consult with the community as, as part of the review of, special, of the special rate following the review of the Aubrey parking strategy. So the parking strategy identifies that it's a cost incorporated in the cost of buildings and roadway facilities. It's a hidden charge on the top of ice of any good or service being car parking. It, uh, the strategy investigated the capital and operating cost of parking provision as well as the collection of revenue as through developer contributions or the parking special rate. And it identified the need to review the special rate in line for aims and objectives of the parking strategy. So the parking strategy takes a longer term view and aims to commence a transition where parking demand is managed and balances the needs of all users and acknowledges that driver behavior will not occur overnight and that alternative models of transport must be viable and convenient before any change can be expected. Uh, the strategy consists of a variety of parking management strategies um, to ensure that, that parking is accessible, equitable, logical, and fit for purpose. 
and the strategy focused on long-term planning to assist with this transition from supply to demand management. With regards to the special rate, the parking strategy specifically noted that it directly opposes the principles of travel demand management in that it prioritised vehicles over the movement of people and goods. And so therefore it's not currently in line with the CBD parking strategy. Uh, it noted that converse, there are examples in, in metropolitan areas such as Sydney and Melbourne where there's a parking sp space levy um, where properties with on-site parking contribute, um, which helps fund other forms of transport such as public transport. In terms of special rate review options and keen to get the feedback of councillors, the, there's a number of options that we've identified so far. Each have their, their pros and cons, benefits and challenges. Uh, we could continue with the current levy, um, which uh, enables the funding of, of car parking in central Albury. Um, it's funded by CBD businesses, which benefit from the use of that parking. However, there are some challenges, particularly for those businesses that have on-site parking. Um, we, as the second option, we could allow exemptions uh, for those that provide that, um, sorry, off-street parking, I should say. Um, however, that flexible model, we would need to determine how you quantify an exemption and what, that would, what value that would provide, and then how to fund the loss of revenue through exemptions. We could introduce a CBD travel demand management levy instead, uh, and that would align with the CBD parking strategy. However, there would be a need to uh, change driver behaviour and consider um, what that means for other forms of parking within the CBD. We could consider stopping collecting the CBD parking special rate, and that would benefit CBD businesses who currently on average contribute uh, over $1,200 a year. Uh, however, we would need to find an alternative funding source for the uh, maintenance of car parking. We could instead incorporate the levy into ordinary rates so that all ratepayers contributed to the cost of the service being CBD car park maintenance. Um, but that poses its challenges in terms of um, the impact on other ratepayers. Uh, the levy represents 1.2% of total ordinary and special rates. So there would be an increase in the order of 1% for um, properties that aren't currently contributing to the uh, special rate. Uh, and an, altern an, an ad additional alternative is to transition over a period of time so that that impact wasn't felt all in one year um, to those other properties. So in terms of next steps, we're looking to come back to the council with a report with uh, this type of information for consideration and so that we can progress this matter, um, but particularly seeking the feedback of councillors to inform next steps and any recommendations that we may make. Thanks, Justin. Councillor Doxy. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Justin, can you just go back to the slide that was earmarked uh, 2017 in relation to the moteliers? Now, where did that go in relation to the clubs themselves then? Because if, did they get the exemption or was it a consideration? So thank you for the question through Mr. Mayor. So we didn't amend the scheme. We noted their submission and resolved to review the CBD's parking special rate following the development or the, the updated Aubrey parking strategy. So at this stage, there's been no exemptions provided or consideration about not just moteliers, but also, you know, clubs and the like that provide off street parking as well. Because it's got a snowballing effect. If you give it to the moteliers, you'll give it to the clubs, you'll give it to somebody else. Correct. Yeah. A lot of consideration in this one. Thank you. Thanks for Graydon. It's uh, really a, a comment. Um, and that is that not everyone will want to, I mean, no one wants to pay uh, for something that's fair. And there are lots of people who would argue that it's not fair when perhaps it might be fair. Um, and I'm conscious of the fact that council provides lots of facilities and services. 
Um, and I've, you know, been given examples by people who are upset about certain things uh, as we undertake our program. And people will say, well, I don't go swimming, so why should I spend money in the pool? Um, or I don't go to the library, so why should I pay for that? And there are people who say, I don't drive, I just have a bicycle, so why should I pay for parking and uh, why should I be putting money into that high-rise parking unit? The reality is, at the end of the day, everyone gets something, some benefit somehow um, from council, and so somehow we have to find a way of, of paying for it um, and charging that. Uh, and I'm just very conscious, of, as uh, Councillor Doxy has said, very conscious of the fact that no matter what we do, there will be groups um, within the um, community who won't like whatever we do. Um, and so I, I, I suppose the best way will be to, uh, if we are going to change something, uh, to make that change as little as possible or over a significant period of time so that that impact is lessened uh, somehow. That's all I can say because we'll have to charge something somewhere to enable this. Yeah. Thank you. Councillor Thurley. Oh, it's just a comment. Really, we don't have such a charge at Lavington. Um, and yet there's probably a strong argument that it would be more just to have it at Lavington because the businesses here do provide um, off-street parking. You know, lots of them do provide off-street parking. <coughs> But if you go out to Lavington, there's a huge overflow from uh, Lavington, you know, the Woolworths complex there, um, and even Coles. Uh, there's lots of overflow parking that occurs. So I don't have, I don't have an answer, and I don't. Um, uh, I think this is a complex one, very complex. Councillor Anderman. Uh, yeah, just a quick one. Uh, I don't think it'll ever happen that we introduce a CBD travel demand management levy. Um, that's just not going to ever work. Um, I'd prefer to have a look at uh, providing some limited exemptions for those people that provide significant um, off-site or on-site parking now, um, like the, 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 the couple of clubs in town. I mean, uh, they provide a huge parking uh, benefit uh, to the community. Um, so that that would be what I'd look at. Um, but I, I don't think there's an easy answer to this one, whatever we do. Thank you. Councillor Con. Um, probably need more time to think about it. So these are sort of tentative comments rather than really considered ones. Um, I'm tempted to get rid of it. I think by exempting people who provide off-street parking, we might end up with a world where everybody wants to provide more off-street parking. And as we get more infill development in the CBD, certainly if that ends up being multi-deck or underground, that's all right, but I don't want to end up with a CBD that's full of lots of small car parks. Um, it's not a good way to design the centre of a city. Um, and I also take Councillor Thurley's comments on board about Lavington. Um, now is probably not the time for a travel demand management, travel demand management levy, although I'd love to see one in another decade. Um, and I wonder if the, the interim step would be to get rid of it. But happy to discuss and consider further. Thank you. Uh, just a question before for um, Brad, if I could, in relation to Keywall Street, the all day parking, is it my understanding that it's uh, averaging about 60 to 70% for every day? Is that right? Yeah, so utilisation in Kewa Street's about 65% um, at peak. So, so there is still ample off-street there. Um, as we've discussed earlier, Wilson Street's um, running at pretty close to capacity pre-COVID type stuff. Mm, okay. Yeah. Okay. No, well, I'm uh, of the view that uh, whilst the motel is, I don't disagree with what Graeme's saying, that... Uh, where, do you, where does it stop and where does it finish in terms of that proposition? We did take their submission and, and took it seriously. Uh, I don't know, I'd be interested in some middle ground here, but it's pretty hard to understand what that might be, whether it's uh, transition 
a wife and the special rate to an ordinary rate over multiple years, but reduce the rate in terms of not get rid of it altogether because we need, still need to pay for the parking. The other alternative, and God bless us all, if we uh, actually, instead of leveraging 1.8, one, uh, an average of 1,800 per property here in the city, maybe we do, um, or 1,200 per property, maybe we do share it over all our CBDs where we have responsibility for parking because it's a little bit, um, a little bit antiquated, this model, because as David did raise, Lavington and got a lot of parking out there and they don't pay for any of it and we still have to maintain a high percentage of it. So and the Goon is the same. So we've got a we've grown as a city and I think again, I don't think this particular option reflects that very well. And again, back to the motelliers, the motelliers um, have that demand has changed too. So they're fi they're finding the whole uh, setting a lot tighter. And I'm I hazard a guess they're all finding a bit tight right now, but uh, in terms of inquiries we have all the time from owners of businesses in, in the CBD wanting parking, all day parking, you've got uh, the Keywall Street car park built two years ago that has got, runs its maximum 75% capacity now. Why aren't they parking there? And I think that goes back to the old adage that they just don't want to walk. And that goes for a lot of people working in the tax office. So, you know, I think getting back to the early presentation tonight about compliance, the only way we're going to get them to heal is to start start implementing compliance. And I don't know, that's that circular economy. But I think sharing across the, the weight across the whole city through Lavington and Thaguna and reducing the rate here is my preferred option. But that's flexibility of what we're doing. But back in the day when this was the only CBD, it all worked. I don't know how. When was it first implemented? Do we have any... Yeah, early 80s, so, you know, back in the day, I think we need to move on to, the, on to what the current current um, demands look like. I think we should be sharing it. Okay, thank you, Justin. Wonderful presentation. Um, okay, we've got general business. Anyone with general business? Mr. Zachney, you've always got general business. Um, um, Mr. Mayor, can I just interrupt? Yes, thank you. Um, I have some uh, work commitments now. Um, yes. If it's... Uh, Okay, with you, I'll get a, a briefing tomorrow on the confidential items from um, uh, either Ambrose or from Frank. If that's no problem at all, or give me a call. That's fine. My yeah. apologies, but I do need to. Uh, I've got some work commitments right now. No, thanks for your attendance. No worries. Uh, yes, Graham. Uh, did you know no general business? Okay, we'll move on to the. Uh,